Michelle Marie McGrath. Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Unclassified Woman. Today, I'm happy to be talking to the fabulous Katora Kendrick, a lovely American lady who is based currently in China. Katora is a blogger and podcaster who's lived on three different continents and traveled to more than a dozen countries. For years, she's written about her life as a single woman who sees being unmarried as a lifestyle choice like any other as opposed to an illness from which she must be cured. She also writes about her lifelong disinterest in motherhood, critiquing the cultural expectation that black women in particular are destined to birth and raise children. An English teacher by trade, she has discussed her favourite books with her students in New York City, Kigali, Rwanda and currently Shanghai in China. Her debut collection of essays, No Thanks, Black, Female and Living in the Martyr Free Zone will be published in June 2019. Katora enjoys food and travel. Specifically, she enjoys eating her way through her favourite countries. And who can blame her? I'm pretty fond of doing that myself. So, I hope you really enjoy today's conversation. So, welcome Katora. So great to have you here today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. No, it's wonderful. It's just fascinating to hear all these different stories and perspectives from women all over the world. And I know that you're currently in Shanghai, is that right? That is correct. I am. And so how did you get to be there at the moment? And would you mind sharing a little bit about your background? Sure. I am a secondary English teacher by trade. I am from America. I call New York City and New Orleans home. Um, So I spent about 10 years teaching um, secondary English in New York City and decided I needed a break from America. Um, I wanted to see the world and travel. And luckily, being an English teacher is a pretty transferable job. Yeah, (laughs) great. So I spent two years in Rwanda in East Africa and thoroughly enjoyed traveling around that continent. And once my time was up in Rwanda, I decided to give Asia a try and happened to find a really good position here in Shanghai. And so I've been in Shanghai for about two years and have thoroughly enjoyed traveling around Asia. (laughs) Gosh, that's so interesting. You're right, though. That is teaching English as a second language. I mean, that is something that you can do in so many places. That's a great way to travel. Yeah, I was very fortunate because when I became a teacher, it wasn't my intent that you didn't travel the world. But when I decided I wanted to, I was like, oh, this worked out perfectly. (laughs) Brilliant. And so, Katora, would you mind sharing a bit more about whether you've not had a child due to personal choice or whether it's been due to a combination of circumstances in your life? Sure. It is absolutely, completely personal choice. And I do know for more than a few women who are my age, um, I am 43, who are my age and who are without children. It's often a mixture of kind of choice, but more like circumstance. I, I never had a situation where I wanted to do it or that was ideal. But for me, it's always been explicitly a personal choice. Um, I have known since I was a child myself that motherhood was not going to be my thing. Um, I can't really explain why, but it was just clear to me in in certain situations um, when my friends were around and talking about, you know, imagining their grown up lives. Children always seem to in a roundabout, subtle way be a part of that. And although I didn't have the words for it, I was just clear, no, there won't be a child in my house. There won't be a baby in my belly. Um, so it was, this has definitely been a lifelong choice and not related to circumstance at all. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? So just as some people are so clear that that is what they want, you were very clear from a young age that you didn't think that that was going to be a part of your path. Yes, yes, exactly. And like you said, I had girlfriends growing up who were either like, 
mm, I'm indifferent or kind of what I think happens to a lot of women and probably men. You don't think either or you just assume that it's going to happen because yes. if you're in a job, you have a job, you have children. Um, so, but I had girlfriends who were very clear. I had one friend in elementary school who was like, I will be having two children, one boy, one girl. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, but I was also very clear in many conversations that, that came up as I was growing up and also as a young woman. Yeah, I'm not going to be having any. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? How often we can be really clear. Like you, I assumed it probably would happen, but I always questioned the assumption that it was a foregone conclusion that never felt right to me. I always felt very irritated by that. Mm-hmm. It's in, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And so did you ever feel any pressure about that to change your mind from your family or your close friends? That's a question that's a, a bit more complicated for me to answer. There was a time in my life where I would have not said I felt pressure. I think when I first started writing about being child free by choice and sort of vocalizing more um, explicitly, this is a choice I have made, I would have said, oh, no, no one ever bothered me. It was no big deal. But the more I reflect and the more especially when I talk to other child-free women and I start thinking about um, my life, there has always been just beneath the surface um, what I like to call sort of shade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this notion that you're being silly you're being selfish, you're going through a phase and not sort of overtly, you're an awful, awful person. But what has happened a lot, I think, in subtle ways is it's been implied that I'm a broken woman. Something is wrong with me. Um, and I can recall when I would say things when I was a, a young girl myself or a young woman, when I would say, oh, I'm not going to have kids or when people would assume, oh, when you get kids, you're going to, I'm like, and I would say, oh, well, that's never going to happen. I won't have kids. There was always this mockery <laughs> in a yeah. way, this sort of, oh, you, oh, I, I remember when I used to say that or uh, my, what really irritates me, but when you meet the right man. <laughs> oh, I know. I would get to vote on my womb. I, I never quite understood, <laughs> quite understood that you're only saying this because you have not been really in love. Um, so there has been, and I grew up in a very sort of religious and a fundamentalist religion. And I grew up in the South of, um, America, which is known as the Bible Belt. Yeah. And it was sort of, it was, it was reinforced to me mostly in indirect ways, not necessarily overtly in indirect ways that the only thing that validated women, godly women, was being someone's wife and being someone's mother. You could do other stuff too. You know, you could have your little job, you can write your little books, yeah. you can you know, go to go to your little brunch with your friends, you know, you can, you know, find a cure to cancer. That's all cool. But really, if you're going to call yourself a complete and full woman, there has to be a husband and a baby. And particularly the baby part seemed to be a big part of what I was, I was supposed to have. To, to be a full woman. So I, I never really got on Christmas or Thanksgiving, where's your baby? It wasn't that, but it's just a number of sort of subtle ways that people would imply that I eat. I'm very childish and then I'm trying to avoid adulthood because I don't want children that I'm being unfair to my phantom husband who may or may not appear yeah. <laughs> by deciding that I won't have children, although I don't have a husband or that I'm just going through a phase and I would change my mind when I met the husband or my ovaries kept me up late at night. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting. This assumption that it's, it is just a phase and that you'll snap out of it. It's raising a human being. Like how does one snap? <laughs> yeah. Well, I like Doritos and not, no, it's not, it's not, it, it, it's raising a human being. Either you're going to do it or you're not. And I get that there are some women who quote unquote change their minds or who have been indifferent all along and then decided, you know, to be mothers as well. But I think when you know you, it's kind of like, you know, your own mind, you know, your own brain. And when you have people telling you what they believe to be benign, such as, you know, you'll change your mind. It's just, 
irritating because what you're implying is you know my mind <laughs> better than I do, although it's been my mind for much longer. Yeah, and and if that was true, then that would make it sound like you're not really of sound mind. And if that is the case, then you probably shouldn't be embarking on having a baby. <laughs> Exactly. I tell people all the time that you shouldn't convincing a woman to have a baby should not be your goal. Like you should, if someone says I don't, I don't want to have a baby yet, girl, don't have that baby because it seems like in the best circumstance, if you want motherhood and you get a child who's just relatively difficult, it's a lot of hard work. So if yeah. if I am already disinterested, then you should not try to convince me to be interested because it's just. just a case of this is like a recipe for disaster it seems like absolutely and doesn't that seem logical and sane and sensible and yet people will try to convince you otherwise (laughs) I've always said I just don't know why it seems so confusing to people I just think it makes logical sense that you should not have a baby to, to figure out if you really don't want one (laughs) <laughs> exactly like you that. can't go back on that decision can you it's not like buying a new car yeah you can't you mean I'm not gonna you shouldn't try to convince me to maybe think about having a baby or have a baby just to see just to see if I really don't want that baby yeah and that kind of ties into that phrase that you often hear as well because I, I remember being told this a few times as well but you you'll change your mind when the baby's here once you mm-hmm. have that baby you'll love it and you'll feel differently it's a bit a pretty big risk to take isn't it and, and, and here's the thing. <laughs> In the last few years, there's been another movement, not just women speaking up about choosing not to have children. There have been there's been a movement of mothers speaking up about regretting that decision, which I think is very sad, isn't it? It's sad, but I also find it a bit a bit courageous because what I what I what I hear in them saying is that I don't regret the children. I'm glad that these children are here and I'm going to fulfill my responsibility to raise them. But I regret choosing motherhood. Yeah. And I, 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 again, I get that. And part of the reason why I've made a choice in the last few years to become more vocal in my writing um, and featuring other child women on my podcast, I've become more vocal is because I think people underestimate how damaging and how detrimental it is to make the word woman synonymous with mother. Because the women who come forward and say, I regret it had no idea they could feel that way. <laughs> they yeah. had no idea that a sane woman could regret motherhood. And that is because we have convinced generations of women and men that there is some sort of natural maternal instinct that every woman has. <laughs> yeah, which is just not true. I mean, some exactly. some women will never feel any inkling towards that whatsoever and are very clear about it. Exactly. And I think if if it became more of us basically saying parenthood in general, it's just a lifestyle choice. It's a lifestyle choice that some people take on and have moments of happiness, moments of sadness, like any lifestyle choice that it's not necessarily tied to your gender or your womanhood, like yeah. the mothers, the mothers I know who, who, although they find it difficult, but don't regret it and who love it and who feel like it's helped them become a better person. That's a tie to their personhood. It's not, it's not a tie to their womanhood. Yes. Yeah. True. That's very true. And and some people will say, I didn't realize how selfish I was until I had a child. Now, okay, but that, that may be completely true for them. It doesn't mean it's true across the board. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I think women are not monolithic. And I, I think this idea of what do you call it, the maternal instinct or whatever, I, I don't think it is as scientifically based as we would believe. I think women have been having children all of this time because it's just sort of been what's been expected. Yeah. Um, and it's just so un- <laughs> it's just such um, I mean, it's unconscious it's conditioning, kind of isn't it? It's a necessary thing. I mean, you have to procreate, but I don't think this whole, I don't really want to have children is a new thing since the internet happened. I think in the 1800s, <laughs> there were women having babies who were like, well, I've got this baby. <laughs> I mean, but, but had she had access to birth control and education and it was in a time period where saying no to motherhood was a bit more of an option, 
there's a likelihood that there have been more women saying no. Yeah, and you raise a good point as well because it, I mean, even today in, in many places, there are women who might not want that, but they don't have a choice and they don't have access mm-hmm. to contraception. Yep, yep, definitely. So we're definitely. very we're very fortunate that we do have that option. But yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to believe that there are, you know, millions of women around the world who don't have that in, um, yeah. you know, especially in like third world countries as well. And, you know, there's just... I can't imagine what it must be like to feel that you have no no say over your own body, really. Yeah, yeah, very, very true. Um, and I just I wonder too, like the to the extremes of how aware women yeah. are um, that they don't necessarily have control over their bodies. I, I think in many cases it might be just the way it was generations yeah. ago. The developing world, you just had a baby and you didn't think about that kind of stuff, and. And if we're being honest, the other options outside of family and mothering were limited anyway. So it's it's one of those things that I think that we can only have this conversation and have these sort of intellectual discussions about it because we are aware of all of the world around us. We're not choosing. But yeah. Yeah, very tricky and very interesting times and great that there are so many like much more public discussion about this. And so, as we know, it's just not the role of every woman to be a woman, even if she wanted that. It's not always biologically possible for everybody. There are so many different factors and Mm -hmm. situations that come into play. So, we know that obviously many of us have got different roles and responsibilities, different paths to take, different gifts, different abilities. And so really it's about us trying to embrace the diversity in all of that and recognize that everybody has a different role. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. I agree completely. So it just... Yeah, there are, there is, isn't there? And it seems to be about just that increase in tolerance of other people's choices and decisions for their lives. We're not all the same in that and we're not all meant to be doing the same thing. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, so also obviously we know that it's one way of expressing ourselves creatively because we are creative beings as women we're very cyclical so how do you say that you enjoy using your creative energy i mean i realize that you're obviously you're teaching as well and you're teaching people mm-hmm. to express themselves in a language that's not their first language mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm a writer. I blog. Um, yep. I I have a book coming out next spring. So my my most um, common way of creative expression is the written written word. Um, for me, being with people in general brings me a sense of um, creativity. Brings me a sense of connection. So. When it comes to expressing my creativity, I do that through writing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I find that I think everybody needs people, whether that is young people, old people, your peers, just having a community of people in many ways helps me express every part of myself, um, particularly when they are really good friends who I feel have my best interest in mind. So I would say that's probably the way I go about that yeah and so it's interesting that you say that really it really is about complete self-expression isn't it and knowing that you're expressing your true self and being really on your path and that's going to look different for every woman yes it will definitely and so I think the key is really to really have that strong relationship with yourself and know what your values are and what's important to you so that you're not as easily swayed and persuaded by other people's opinions around you and you might you know being talked into something that you don't really want to do if you're feeling unsure or ambivalent yeah and I can honestly say I I, I've been extremely grateful 
that I have always been a woman, even when I was a young woman and had my own self doubt and not listening to your inner voice type of issues. This is one thing on which I've always been very clear, even when I wasn't necessarily honest <laughs> with other people, particularly men I was dating who I thought were really cool and who would be, would be good potential partners. I mean, I've always been honest with them, but I was always clear in myself that this wasn't something I saw for myself and I stuck to my guns. Um, and when I look back on my life and what I was told would happen to me at this point in my life because I did not have children. Um, everyone was wrong but me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And only, but that just reinforces only you know what's really right for you. Yep, exactly. And I think when you're younger, like most things, it's not just being child free, but I think like most things, particularly when you're a young woman, you're, you're, you're raised so often, even when your parents try hard not to, society is society. There are so many ways in which we encourage and blatantly tell young women every other voice but your own is important. So when it comes to something this significant and such a dominant part narrative of many cultures that adult means parent, woman is synonymous to mother. When you're told that so often, having the strength of mind and the conviction of character to not try to think about or convince yourself, or maybe they're right. Like I've always been very clear. And there were, there was a time when I was younger when I thought maybe I was being a bit too rigid or I was being a bit too stubborn because I would dismiss people who would tell me, you know, you're too young to know that. Or again, you're going to change your mind or my favorite when I was your age, I I thought that, and now I have four kids, like all of that stuff. I'm yeah, I felt like I was being too rigid. But again, when I look back on my, particularly my early to late 20s, when it started to become an issue more, I think it became more of an issue more in my maybe mid 20s and beyond. I'm so, so grateful that I had the strength of mind to know what I wanted and did not want and that I stayed true to myself. Because as I said a second ago, um, <laughs> all the things that I was supposed to feel as a woman in her early 40s who chose not to have children, everybody was wrong except for me. <laughs> I feel like my life is 20 times fuller than I had planned. I feel like I've accomplished way more things than my little goals <laughs> could ever could ever conceive. And it's all attached to not having children. Yeah. And just really trusting your own instincts about that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm, I'm so glad that I, I, I trusted my instinct and didn't allow myself to be convinced. I'm very, very happy about that. And, you know, you mentioned about like in relationships that you were always very upfront about your beliefs in not wanting children. And did you ever come up against any interesting conversations about that in relationships where anybody tried to persuade you otherwise or were they okay about it? Hmm. Again, I wouldn't say that the men I have dated tried to persuade me. What I, what I did, what I have noticed over the years is that men who claim to want children <laughs> have very interesting reasons or belief systems for why they should have children and what their role will be in raising children. So the most distinct memory I have is a recent um, long-term relationship, um, maybe about not, not necessarily, about four or five years ago. I had gotten to the point where it became clear to me because I was in my late thirties that this was going to be an issue. Like if I waited yeah. three or four months, we were going to have to have the conversation again. Um, so early on into our courtship, um, I made it clear you're not this, you're not the first man I'm having this conversation with. There's been two before you and nothing has changed. And you should know that if fatherhood is something that you desire, you might want to decide how much you desire it because you're never going to get it if you're with me. And his reaction to that 
was interesting to me. So he had made it to his late 30s and early 40s, didn't have any children, was kind of noncommittal in the beginning of our relationship, would start and quit jobs for random reasons, had a difficult time getting up before 10 if he didn't have to be the work at that time. But he sort of went into this existential crisis where he was just like, well, I never, I never just, I, I just always imagined I would. And I know I don't want any right now, but, and I, it, it, I tried hard not to laugh, <laughs> but my thought process was, so the idea of children seems to intrigue you. But when I look at your daily life in daily reality, you feel the same way about a children as I do. You do not want your life interrupted <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> by the tedium of parenting. You have, if you are a, a man who has made it this far without finding a woman to have your children, I find that for that has been much more of a choice for you than you want to admit, because there are far more women in their mid to late thirties who are now dating with the purpose, as they call it, for marriage and motherhood. So if you are a decent, employed, happy, happy happy-go-lucky, kind man, and you have not found a woman who will have your children, that's very intentional, even if you're not saying it. So here I am, one little lady, (laughs) out of probably six that you've dated before, who is saying to you, it won't happen, and now you're having like this existential crisis and are wondering if you really want it. So I think my biggest takeaway when as dating as a, as a woman who's child free by choice is that men believe whether they would admit this or not, that they are entitled to, to, to a baby. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they won't, they won't try to convince me. They'll ask me if I'm sure. And, you know, maybe ha- if they need more time to think if they want to continue dating me. But there is this sort of not so indirect belief that if I'm a good person, I'm a good man, and I show myself to be serious minded, you woman should at least want to have my baby. If we never get to that point, that's one thing. But if you're saying to me, I love you, or I'm feeling we could be something serious, and you don't want to have my baby, you suspect. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's what I've noticed. Men, no man has tried to like persuade me or try to convince me that something's wrong with me. I haven't had that. But what I have noticed is there truly is this expectation that if you are a woman who is claiming to love and support and want to partner with a man, then you should naturally want to have his baby. Yeah, and when I th- when you get to your kind of like say mid to late thirties, around that time forty, I think it's really hard for a lot of men to believe that even if you're saying you're not mm-hmm. you're you're ambivalent or you don't necessarily want a child, even if you're saying that, there's a, a large portion they don't really believe it. They think you're being coy. Yeah, they think. Just haven't realized it yet. They think that you're going to wake up one day crying in the middle of the night because you realize you made a choice. Just like when you tell them you are indifferent to marrying them. You are not telling the truth. You are just saying that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Mm-hmm. But it is. It just shows how strong our conditioning is. Yep. It does. It does. It is very, very strong. And I think. When you when you are a, a, a woman or a man whose life does not fit the dominant narrative, people underestimate how much you see the intensity of that narrative simply because your life is not a part of it. So you're you're more attuned to how how much certain stories are told, how intense and how all consuming expectations and cultural narratives are. Yeah. And I think when when you are particularly a woman who has chosen not to have children, not just you kind of wanted them and didn't happen. When you have been clear, you have rejected motherhood. The, the, the way that we sell motherhood becomes clearer (laughs) and much more acute. 
Yeah, and, and just and just when you you're just not going along with that script, that's the thing. You're yeah. really, you know, switching that and creating something else and refusing to fit into those boxes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, very interesting, isn't it? And so what would you say to somebody who is feeling ambivalent or not sure that it's really for them, but they're feeling a lot of pressure around them? I would say ignore everybody's voice but your own. And that includes your mother. That includes your man. <laughs> that includes yeah. your past. Um, I, here, here's the thing. I want for every woman what I have, absolute joy and fulfillment. If motherhood is that for you, go ahead, girl. Get pregnant. Tell me where you're registered. I will buy you a nice gift. <laughs> but if you are even remotely ambivalent, listen to your voice until you make a decision. Um, because in the, the especially when it comes to motherhood, there is no country on this planet where there truly is holistically equity in the raising of children. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Let's face it. I mean, it's still women, even if you're with a very supportive partner who, you know, does their bit. Most of the time, it is still the mother doing the majority of the tasks and getting up in the night and all of that. I've been to the developed Western world. I've been to the quote unquote developing world. I see some patterns. So if you are, if you are a woman, particularly and you are ambivalent or on the fence as the term happens to come up a lot in, in child free land. Do not get off that damn fence until you have decided you want to get off that fence. Because here's the thing. If you have a good supportive husband at the end of the day, <laughs> I can think of no mother who has said my husband is as exhausted and as spent as I am. It always. <laughs> it uh, always no. <laughs> When the children are young, yes. it always seems the mother who has to sacrifice more of her personal and professional life, who has to do more of the grunt daily work, grunt work, daily work, tedious work of running and maintaining the household, even when she's happy doing that. Like I have a very good friend who stopped working for about seven or eight years to basically be a stay at home mom. And as far as I know, she doesn't regret it. She seemed to enjoy it. And she, when she went back to work, she didn't have any regrets. But it was clear to me that I had made the right choice because I didn't want none of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All the sleep deprivation. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say to someone um, again, cause I think men have this some similar issues, but particularly for a young woman who is ambivalent or who hears the voice clearly, this is not for me. Ignore every single voice. And don't be afraid to tell people to mind your business, because I think that's another thing I had, I had to realize when people would make these passive aggressive comments and we're supposed to just sort of, well, it don't mean any harm. So just know you don't have to be rude. You don't have to get yourself all upset, but call people out. Like when they say, boy, when you have your own kids, you can say, but that won't ever be happening. <laughs> they can deal. They can deal with whatever their reaction is to that. You can pray for them, the process, all that. <laughs> but listen to no one's voice but your own. Yeah, wise words. So important and sometimes hard for people to do depending on how overpowering, you know, the personalities are around them. But it's so true because at the end of the day, it's your life. Mm-hmm. And there's no turning back, really, once, you know, once you've gone through with that and you've made that decision, if you weren't sure, that's a very difficult situation to be in. Yes. And I, I imagine it must be extremely emotionally stressful if you truly are one of those mothers who you love your child, you don't regret the child's presence, you're glad this child is on earth, and you are clear you should not have become a mother. It must be I would assume at some point, especially again, if you have a child who doesn't just have regular childhood difficulties, you have a child with some sort of physical disability or your child just seems it is one of those children who just turns out to be very, very contrary and a discipline problem. And you already know I shouldn't have done this. It has to be very emotionally 
exhausting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It must be awful. I would imagine. Yeah. So, well, thank you. So, yeah, such wisdom in everything you say there. And so would you like to share where people can find out more about you online and more about your writing and also, yeah, more details then about your book coming out next year? Sure. Um, you can follow me on Facebook or Twitter. My name is Katura Kendrick, of course, and my Twitter handle is, I think, at Happy Single <laughs> at Happy Single Gail. As you can see, I'm on Facebook more often than I am on Twitter. Um, I have a podcast, which is very similar to your podcast. It is called Unchained, Unbothered. And the only difference is I focus on women of color yeah. who have chosen not to live in the box that we've talked about in any different ways, not just motherhood, but any box that good black women are supposed to live in. Yeah. Um, so I've changed unbotheredpodcast.com. Uh, my blog is yet another single gal.com and my book will be out next spring. Right now it is tentatively titled. I choose me reflections on freedom, but my publisher says that's too on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sounds like a great title. Thank you. you very clear, it. very clear. <laughs> and one of the topics I do talk about is a collection of essays, and I devote two essays to this notion that woman is synonymous to mother and how if you are a woman who does not want motherhood or who rejects it, you, you are pretty much metaphorically set on fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were pretty much metaphorically set on fire um, in little ways and in big ways. Um, so, yeah, so that's my stuff and where you can find me. No, that's great. Well, thank you very much. So great to hear your perspective on this very emotive topic. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I really enjoy talking to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to Unclassified Woman. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. For information on events and services, connect with Michelle at michellemariemcgrath.com.